Hey everyone, today I'd like to take a look at Dr. Berg again. I say again because I've spoken on Dr. Berg in the past and I certainly received some heat for my comments, which I still stand by. Because I keep getting comments on how wrong I am and how much of a hater I am, I thought, why not make another one? So, in this piece, we'll be shining the spotlight on Dr. Berg yet again to clear up the science behind his claims. So let's dive in. Learn Your Body, a science-based education. We're going to talk about what happens when you eat and when you fast. I'm going to try to keep this really simple, just give you the basics. So when you're eating, you have glucose in the blood, you have amino acids in the blood, you have fatty acids in the blood. And so you have this increase in insulin. So the first thing that happens is this, these nutrients are gonna feed this cell. One of the criticisms I received last video was my mentioning some of the incorrect facts as he describes concepts in his videos. People were complaining that he's trying to teach a lay audience and that I should get my head out of, well, you know where. And realize he's simplifying things. That's never been my point, however. Dr. Berg simplifies things, that's fine, but he gets the facts wrong. So if you simplify the wrong facts, you still have the wrong facts. Still, to his credit, in this simplification, he's right on the money. So far, so good. Insulin opens the door of the cell. So these nutrients can go in there. Now, the extra is going to turn into something called glycogen. So glycogen is the storage of glucose molecules. So we have a bunch of glucose molecules strung together and connected as a storage for glucose. In order for this to be stored, you need potassium. So potassium is really, really important. Also, you retain water when you store glycogen. So for every molecule, of glycogen, you have three to 3.8 times the amount of water. So if you're trying to lose weight and you're doing carbohydrates, especially refined carbohydrates, realize it's not just the weight of those carbohydrates. It's also all the water you're retaining that you're holding inside your glycogen storage unit. So people that eat carbs retain a tremendous amount of water. Again, so far so good, but just to make sure everyone's on the same page, that water he's referring goes into the muscle. So you aren't retaining fat weight, you are making your muscles denser. Now you have about 100 grams of glycogen in your liver and about 500 grams of glycogen in your muscle. Now anything extra, it's gonna spill over and it's gonna be converted into this thing called fat. Here's where he's incorrect. I wrote an article with a few studies backing my claims, but I'll link one of the studies here as I use it to disprove his point. In the context of massive carbohydrate intake, meaning 50% or more of your calories coming from carbohydrates, there's a rise in de novo lipogenesis. That said differently, with massive consumption of carbs, your body does generate more fat. Okay, you might be wondering where I disagree then. This is exactly his point, you idiot. But hold on, while the study did find that mass carb consumption increased fat production, people only generated five grams of fat a day from this excessive carbohydrate intake. That's a really small amount compared to the amount of carbohydrates being consumed, which was nearing 700 grams a day. So does that minuscule amount of fat production pose any threat to fat gain? No, especially not in the context of caloric balance. So then what is happening to the carbohydrates? Well, if you'll allow me to stretch my physiology and bioenergetics a bit, there is an increase in cellular carbohydrate use. This means that as the body has this influx of carbohydrates, the cells of the body will switch to a metabolism known as aerobic glycolysis, wherein they start shifting their energy production from a mixture of fat and carbohydrates to a far more carbohydrate focused metabolism. This allows the body to dispose of the vast majority of these carbs. So, do mass carbs lead to fat gain as Dr. Burke claims? 
No, especially in the context of energy balance. Just as a quick aside before we move on, because I can hear the comments coming, I had a lot of training in my master's program in metabolism and I worked in a metabolism laboratory for three years. Plus, feel free to check out the study for yourself. Let's get back to it. When we go to fasting, everything works in reverse. We stop eating, we have decreased glucose, we have decreased insulin, and the body's gonna use the excess glucose out of the blood. So if you have high levels of sugar in the blood, the body's gonna go after that first to bring that down. He's right here, and the body does decrease blood glucose levels when fasting. Then it's gonna use up your glycogen reserve in your liver, not necessarily the muscles. The muscle glycogen rarely changes even if you don't consume glycogen, because your body will then make glycogen from non-carbohydrate sources, like fat, for example. Here, he's potentially wrong again. The body does use liver glycogen, and you'll experience that level drop in a short fast. But he points out that muscle glycogen rarely changes. And while that may be true for something like an overnight fast and slightly longer, 12 hours, there is a drop in muscle glycogen of 20% or more when looking at 24 to 72 hour fasts, long enough to show a rise in ketones in the blood. This again is evidenced by a study I will link for you. Notice also that in obese individuals, the drop is even more severe than in leaner individuals. Okay, but what about his point about glycogen being created from fat? He's right there. The liver primarily has the power to use a piece of triglyceride molecule, colloquially called a fat molecule, and generate glucose from it, which could be used for glycogen. Regardless, however, glycogen levels will be diminished in muscle long term, and massively so if you throw in exercise into the equation. So you're going to use up your glycogen in your liver, which takes about 6 to 12 hours. And after that occurs, then the body is going to start to make ketones out of your fat. Now, it's not just going to be all ketones. A good portion of your fat is going to be broken down into fatty acids, and you're going to use that as energy. About 40% of that is going to be used for your ketones within 12 to 72 hours. And of course, with time and more fasting, you're going to be more and more adapted into the state of ketosis. Now realize that a small portion of your body uh, needs carbs. Certain parts of the brain, the red blood cells, the eye, a certain part of the kidney. But no problem, you don't need to consume glucose for that. Your body will make the glucose from your own fat and it'll make it from ketones. I'm glad he mentioned this and he's right. The body absolutely needs glucose in the system. Otherwise you go into a coma and die. And it can be produced from fat molecules as we just went over. As you continue, your body's gonna go through this adaptation, this very efficient system of cleaning up old damaged proteins and recycling even microbes. It's called autophagy. And during this process, a lot of therapeutic things are gonna happen. You're gonna have regrowing of damaged brain tissue. You're gonna have improvement and repair in heart tissue. And at the cellular level, your immune system is gonna get stronger and stronger and stronger. This is where he takes some simple concepts and blasts into another stratosphere with some of the claims made. As a huge fasting proponent, I'm not surprised he decided to mention all the wonderful benefits of fasting, but that discussion is far more nuanced than fasting will heal your whole body. It's not that simple. In certain cases, fasting seems to help improve health. In other cases, it can be detrimental. And in other cases, we don't have enough science on the matter. But I understand how that isn't as attractive of an answer. So if you want to go with fasting is the holy grail, then feel free. But you'll be wrong some of the time. As for his brief point on autophagy, it's well taken. It's generally true. And that is what my last piece of content was, where I corrected him on a few facets of his explanation. Because they weren't correct, yet people didn't like an autophagy researcher in medical school correcting a chiropractor on autophagy. So I'll digress. Let's just stop before we get into that headache. 
what he says here on autophagy is correct. Thanks for watching this Spotlight episode. I hope you learned something, and if you are a huge fan of Dr. Berg and hate anything negative said about his alternative facts, feel free to leave me a comment describing my idiocy. As for the rest of you, I hope to have the absolute pleasure of speaking with you in the near future. Cheers.